All right, hi everybody. Uh, I'm Kevin Sykowski from the University of Toledo. And uh, this is part of Globe Mission Earth. We're gonna have our urban heat island webinar tonight. And I'll share my screen and kind of give an introduction here. And even though we have a small crowd tonight, uh, we record them. And I know we get about 50 views on each of these recordings, which is pretty good. I'm not going to become millionaires, but mm. I see a blank screen. <laughs> now, do you see stuff on your screen? Yeah. Yes. All right, <laughs> good. That's a great, great start. Okay, so tonight we're talking about what data did you collect in your neighborhood and what does it mean? Because this year for Urban Heat Island, in fact, we're looking at is my neighborhood making me hot? Of course, I wish it was tonight. <laughs> mm. And this is a bigger uh, part of a bigger project called Globe Mission Earth. And here's our partners on the left. I'm at the University of Toledo. David's at Tennessee State University. Other partners at Boston University. And uh, oh, Angie's at NASA Langley. We have UC Berkeley and West Ed. And then this is our reach map. These are the people we work with across the country and teachers. So each dot is a school, for instance. Yeah. That's a good reach. Uh, this is our second in a series of four webinars to support the Urban Heat Island campaign. And so our next one will be February 11th after the uh, December observations and before March. So we're taking observations in October, December, and March this year. And then we have another one in April. Now, I just, I, I had to talk about this, right? I can't leave this to go, but... Here's the map, snow map from this morning. A uh, lot of snow on the ground in the United States and we're here, we're, oh, where's the scale or legend? Uh-oh. Well, anyway, there's some amount of snow on the ground, four or five inches of snow. Up, I know in Ann Arbor here, they got 11 inches. So across central Michigan, a lot more snow, western New York and generally light, but having that snow on the ground really helps for cooling things down. So here's our weather map for right now. Uh, we had the cold front go through and the associated rain and snow. Big high pressure, this came out of Canada and um, bringing down the cold air. The blue lines are isobars and we have a warm front and cold front now coming into the, the west. And just to zoom in on the, the Midwest. You know, these are station miles. I'm hoping most everybody has seen station miles before. I know in some states it's like a fourth grade standard, which I think is kind of crazy. Yeah. But you can see uh, temperatures. So in Illinois here, temperature 15, calm winds. Uh, for us, we were at like about 19 degrees. But if we look at the dew points, here's a dew point of negative two, negative one in Iowa. We're at about eight. Now I mentioned at my house, we're at nine degrees right now course in Fahrenheit but we'll see temperatures below zero tonight in parts of the Midwest which I think is pretty early it's going to break a lot of records all right so tonight's lineup we have David Padgett he's going to share with us um, okay I'm not sure I don't remember <laughs> but you're going to share something I know that satellite then, satellite science or, okay that sounds good that's what was on, um, yeah. okay and then Vicki Gorman is a teacher at Medford um, Middle School in New Jersey. We'll talk about doing uh, this in her classroom and Angie will talk about other data sets. So I'm gonna stop sharing and turn it over to David. Okay, so good evening. I'm going to uh, share my screen here. And Can everybody see that? Yeah. yeah. So yep. oftentimes with the, with the GLOBE protocols, we can um, incorporate science lessons within them. And so teaching the uh, students about satellites. Uh, oh, yeah, Kevin, how much time do I have? For you? you know, we're looking at about 10, 15 minutes for each person. OK, OK, good, OK. Not a lot. So. Some, teaching about the electromagnetic spectrum can be 
<laughs> learning learning the electromagnetic spectrum can be somewhat of a, a daunting and abstract task, but uh, we deal with several wavelengths uh, in the globe atmosphere protocols that we can point out to students and show them actual real world applications of these uh, electromagnetic spectrum wavelengths so that they don't seem so far out and abstract in those squiggly lines that we see on this uh, diagram. So this is normally how we are introduced to the electromagnetic spectrum and, and wavelengths and gamma rays and x-rays. And I guess the most, you know, there's some familiar terms on the spectrum like microwaves. Um, most of the children or some of the children have heard of those, I guess, in the uh, more highly developed countries at least. And then of course, radio waves. But other than those wavelengths, well, what, what is this all about? Um, so we start off with the uh, energy budget and get the uh, young people, students, uh, whoever else is involved to understand that incoming solar radiation, that shortwave radiation that comes in uh, from the sun uh, doesn't necessarily warm the Earth's atmosphere. And again, this is the uh, that, that Earth's atmospheric energy balance diagram that we're often presented and you can see the little, you know, confused person there. Can, it's kind of abstract, all the arrows and, you know, what does that all mean? But we can uh, somewhat simplify that as we wor work through uh, the globe protocols. Wow. Okay. <laughs> We're in slow motion. Um, hmm, that's interesting. Okay, so it's coming. Okay. We can see it. <laughs> so a lot of the students, because you know, they uh they get exposed to GPS and satellites and all that, but it's amazing how uh little people understand how GPS works. Uh, you know, those of us who were around during the space age, remember the, you know, sitting there and well, obviously first 50 years ago, uh, watching the um, moon landing. And then after that, uh, just the space shuttle and the satellites and so on and so forth. Um, but now it's not really, the fascination isn't there with young people unless they're really, I guess, I guess they would be considered nerds if they are, but you know, your mainstream student is just not interested in space. Uh, any student, as a matter of fact, I have um, about two thirds of my students in my World Regional Geography class are, I guess, STEM majors and they are um, young women. And I asked them a couple of weeks ago what momentous occasion occurred in terms of women in STEM, uh, and I got a bunch of blank stares. I said, okay, spacewalk, hint, hint, more blank stares. They had no idea uh, that there had been an all-woman spacewalk uh, just a couple of days before that. No idea. Um, and so a lot of our students really don't understand the whole concept of space and, and satellites in the first place. Um, I remember a few years ago uh, when I guess there, there was like 98% of cell phones were maintained on one satellite and that satellite kind of went out of orbit and no cell phones were working for about three hours and people thought it was the end of the world. And uh, people, and then that same satellite, I think managed about 60 some percent of the transactions done by, by ATMs and, and uh, gas stations. And so nobody could get gas and, and nobody could um, talk on the cell phone. They thought, well, well, this is it, it's in the world. Not realizing it was, it was just that satellites are involved in that much of our lives. I mean, a lot of people, um, but by looking at the um, various equipment we use in the uh, globe atmosphere protocol, you can see that the GPS receivers, uh, we can talk about radio waves coming from satellites and being captured by the GPS receivers. Uh, then, of course, the uh, infrared thermometers capture long wave infrared radiation. Uh, and then I, I like to use 
this, this particular uh, Garmin GPS 72, uh, which is an older model. It's been updated with the Garmin GPS 76 and 78, but they can still be purchased, um, used from various vendors. Uh, but they have a nice big face, as you can see, and light, nice large fonts. But the really good thing is that the, the display shows the satellite geometry and also shows these which satellites are connecting uh, with the receiver. And so the student can really have an idea of where they are spatially relative to these satellites. And then we can talk about, you know, why you can't necessarily get an Uber easily in places like Atlanta or New York or Chicago. And because they don't see this on their mobile devices, they just see uh, everything else except for the technology that is behind uh, those Uber and, and Lyft um, platforms. So this, so we can talk about the satellites and where they are in geosynchronous orbits and all those types of things uh, by using these very simple GPS receivers. And course, when we are outside, what in the world? When we're outside of, and we can talk about incoming solar radiation or ultraviolet radiation, UV waves that are emitted by the sun and come down on us when we are outside. Uh, and and a, lot, a lot of the students, uh, you know, how would they know that there is a difference between uh, incoming solar radiation and thermal radiation. Why, why would they ever know that? But that's, I guess that's why we're here, uh, to show them uh, what's happening and what's all around them, the, this radiation that's all around them every day that affects them. Uh, and then I guess the most obvious wavelength on the electromagnetic spectrum that is um, related to satellites is uh, visible, visible light wavelengths. And so then when we start to talk about satellites having different bands, uh, we might say a satellite is a, a infrared or false color or visible light, uh, then it kind of starts to make a little bit more sense that, oh, so this satellite can see the thermal radiation, this other satellite perhaps can see visible light, and the thermal radiation obviously is not uh, visible to the naked eye, and so that's what these instruments do. They make those wavelengths visible that are not necessarily visible to us, uh, while our eyes can certainly see the visible light, wa light wavelengths. Well, we can't see those others, but these instruments can. And then we can talk about all the things that we can use those instruments for, uh, like it's like to detecting the onset of El Nino and and how everything associated with El Nino uh, can be uh, forecast into the future. Um, and we also can look at the onset of other uh, atmospheric and climate phenomena uh, based upon what these satellites can detect. And of course, when we, um, uh, <laughs> when we start to use our, our very, very um, neat uh, correlation between our globe data and satellites, uh, then the students really, really uh, get a better idea of what's happening uh, when they use the um, uh, when they use the the app, uh, the Globe Data Collector, the Globe Collector app, and we, we can um, start to see how and why we might still need uh, on the ground observations 
because simply the satellites can't see everything. And it really gives the students a boost in saying, okay, well, these students, these satellites are really powerful and they can see a lot, but uh, sometimes we can see things from our perspective uh, that the satellites can't see, especially when we start to look at um, clouds and uh, weather related to clouds such as tornadoes and that's why we still have storm spotters because you know satellites can't necessarily uh, see a tornado um, although the technology is getting really good I mean for, for the first time I, I know that that they make uh, tornado warning or announcements based upon uh, not ground observations but based upon re uh, what's seen on satellite imagery, which is, which is interesting, um, as a, being a storm spotter myself. And so, again, when we start to use, my students start to use the Global Observer app, and then the question is, well, how accurate were, were our observations compared to what the satellites see. And, and this, this is, you know, of course, a really, really neat thing that these um, uh, globe observations with satellite comparisons come so quickly, uh, you know, like literally within maybe 12 hours uh, or even the next day or at least by the next class period, uh, you can look at the ground observation here on the left and then look at what the satellite saw. So in this case, my students thought they saw cumulus clouds uh, and the satellite saw cumulus clouds, little disagreement over whether they were translucent or opaque. Uh, and then the satellite also saw some mid-level clouds. And it's really difficult, as you all know, to differentiate between those low-level and mid-level and mid clouds uh, until after you've had a few, a um, little bit of experience per se, but, but this, this really brings it all home when we can get a satellite match so quickly after the students have made an observation. And I think we just have another satellite match from another day. And uh, I don't know what is going on here. Um, well, everything's in slow motion, right? Yes. Yeah, so we have again another day. So on this day, our um, students. Now there was no doubt that day that there were some low-level clouds. I mean, I mean, but then notice the satellite didn't see them. So perhaps the satellite might not necessarily be able to pick up those very low-level clouds on certain days. Again, stressing the importance of human observation and. and the importance of globe schools and how they play an important role in uh, helping scientists uh, get a full picture of what's happening uh, in the atmosphere. And oh my goodness! And again, and I'm just going to not belabor the point. So you can get the idea. That, like I said, the uh, I really like this. Uh, satellite matches. The fact that it comes quickly is great because especially when you're dealing with younger kids, you know, their, their memory lasts about a couple of days and, or, or, and if you did something this week, the following week, um, you know, they're, they don't know what's going on. But if you get a satellite match that next day, they, oh yeah, we did that yesterday. Um, I don't know if we're going to do questions until the end or are we doing questions at all? Um, we could. Um... And we could pause and uh, for some questions <clears throat> and uh, let's see how it goes. So any questions for David on satellite remote sensing? I know it's one of the hard things for my students. Yeah, I'll unmute you. See you. There you are, I unmuted you. But you did mute me, that's okay. I did, yeah. <laughs> probably basic one, but I haven't been uh, using the system at all. So when you're talking about that global observation app, is that under the 
you know, you go to the Globe website, or is that something you download from the, um, you know, the App Store or? Oh, the Observer app. Yeah. How do you access that? Yeah, we how to get the app. But yeah, and it's free and it's very user friendly. Um, especially maybe not maybe not adult friendly. Right. <laughs> but but the, the young people, no problem. So I would just go to the app store and look up global you know, <laughs> taking the pictures. That's where they need a little help is with the photo. Photograph. I have to walk them through it, uh, maybe the first time, but using the app, they, 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 they use apps. Okay. Can I make a comment? Yeah, I don't, sure. I don't have a question, but I think with those satellite matches and, um, you know, them learning about this, it's also a really good point for them to develop, you know, some critical thinking and skepticism and not just yeah. Because they tend to assume that, oh, well, if NASA said it, it must be right. You know, the idea that the satellite maybe could miss something is a foreign idea to a lot of young students. Right. And um, uh, Marcy put a question in the chat box. And I don't know the answer to that question. I think I understand what Marcy's talking about is, you know, there are oak trees that hold on to their leaves well into the winter, or, you know, different types of trees. You know, some trees lose their leaves early and some not. And when you're doing the different apps, um, it asks, you know, is the ground dry, muddy, and are there leaves on the trees? So that's a good question. I'll try to remember to ask uh, some of the cloud people about that. I can ask Mari Lay about that tomorrow. Oh, that'd be great. Okay, so um, let's uh, move on to Vicki and have Vicki talk about what she does. So Dave, you have to unshare. There we go. All right, Vicki, okay. I'll turn it over to you. Yep, can you guys hear me? Mm -hmm. Yes. Good. I just got done with another hour and a half webinar and I thought, watch that I can't, whoops. Did that come up? Yeah. Yes. yes. I just have to maximize it and do that. And I have to minimize my screen. Okie dokie. Um, so the question that I was asked to talk about tonight is how to get your, or the, the statement, how to get your students to develop a research question and stewardship project. Mm. Hello, my name is Vicki Gorman and I am from New Jersey, uh, South Central Jersey to be exact, Burlington County. In Medford, I teach at Memorial Middle School, which is right there. We have 700 students, seventh and eighth grade. We're considered a rural district, but that will soon change because of all the development that we are having. Uh, soon we will be considered suburban. I teach four seventh grade classes, 25 students about per class, give or take, uh, geoscience and chemistry. There I thought you guys might be interested in seeing our tribal wall. One of the things I do in October, all the students um, get uh, put into small cooperative learning groups called tribes and they stay in those groups all year, uh, simulating what they would do in an actual workplace, having to work with people day in and day out, uh, handling problems, you know, uh, celebrating successes and all that good stuff. I also teach two CSEP classes. CSEP stands for Citizen Science Ed uh, Education Program. Um, my CSEP students are seventh and eighth grade. They're the ones who are my main globe students and they also do community outreach. 
So the question is, number one, how do you get students to pick a research question? And number two, how do you um, incorporate stewardship projects into your lessons or your curriculum? So we're going to talk about research question first. Now, what this is not going to be is telling you what a good research question is, because all of you know that um, if you're a teacher watching this who hasn't done a lot of research, you can absolutely Google that and find very easy information, uh, easy to understand information that can talk about what a good research question is. The real question is, how do you get students to get the research question? Well, here's something. There's always something fun to do. And I want you to remember that on one hand, maybe on your vacation days. But on the other hand, I want you to forget it because fun has nothing to do with picking a research question. Now, the students will have fun because they're actually doing um, work like a professional. You'll make them understand that they're having fun and they will believe they're having fun. But don't let fun and emotion run your judgment as a teacher when you're trying to figure out these research questions. So where do we start? What do we do? Well, it all starts with the teacher. Honestly, scouts honor. Well, I wasn't a scout, 4-H honor. So what does that mean? Well, what does that look like? You want to first decide as a teacher, what can you support? What do you want to support? Um, what time do you have, both in and out of school? What time are you allowed to work on this? What money do you have? Which, of course, the answer with most teachers is, is zero. What resources do you have? You don't want to pick some, uh, let your students pick a research question and you have no equipment for it. You want to make sure you see what equipment you have or what equipment is available to you. What protocols, since this is Mission Earth and we're talking GLOBE, what protocols are out there that you know your students could do that you could support? What field camp campaigns are going on. And then, of course, the level of your students. This doesn't mean um, that you have to work to the level of your students. It's just keep in mind the level of your students. All of these types of research, especially on GLOBE, elevate students. And so they reach higher than what you think their potential is. So always remember that. What else can we use for support? Well, what administrative support do you have? Do you need administrative support? What standards uh, do you have to fit into your curriculum? Uh, collaboration goals. Do you want to collaborate with a school in your district, a uh, globe school in the country, or with another country? Historical data. And this is an important one because, for example, two years ago, we started, we do a lot of work with satellites here. And um, we did some SMAP comparisons for the soil moisture active passive satellites. And we found a new protocol that works much better than the GLOBE protocol. However, we wanted to test it over several years before we actually went um, to NASA and said, hey, can you change this protocol on GLOBE? And then your strengths, okay? I'm hoping the teachers who will watch this understand work to your strengths. Don't worry about your weaknesses. Uh, yeah, that's fine to think you want to improve yourself and all that good stuff. But when you're working with students, you want to feel really comfortable. So make sure you're looking at your strengths. And then it just basically becomes project-based learning or problem-based learning. So are we ready for the students yet? Well, not exactly. We have a couple more things to do. So as a teacher, you have to understand the following. These are the things that you're going to keep in mind as you go through uh, the preparation for your students to pick a research question. Uh, projects revolve around a significant question, problem, issue. Uh, content has to be significant. Otherwise, you're just manufacturing lessons and they're not authentic and they're not ones that students are going to really own and really enjoy. Students have to be able to take control of their learning and develop self-direction skills. So here the problem is, if you make it too difficult, if you allow them to pick a research question that's going to frustrate them or turn them off within the first week or two of research, you've now destroyed what could be an absolutely wonderful experience for your kids. 
collaboration should be included, at least with peers and professionals in the field, community members, uh, in person and online. You know, contact uh, somebody through GLOBE, through NASA, through NOAA. Uh, scientists are more, engineers are more than willing to Skype with students or to have a Zoom meeting. Make sure your timeline allows for adequate reflection and revision. I find in teaching in general, this is the toughest thing. Teachers forget to make sure they have adequate reflection and revision, whether it be peer revision, uh, self-reflection, teacher revision, or something outside of your classroom. And then of course, the knowledge has to be shared that your students gain in research. So if they're going to a SRS, Student Research Symposium, or the, they're going to participate in the IVSS, the International Virtual Science Symposium. Maybe they're going to the annual meeting. But if they can't go to any of those things or do those things, find an authentic audience where you are, whether it's the Board of Education, whether it's at a faculty meeting, whether it's um, your uh, township people, uh, whether it's an organization, whatever the case may be, make sure you find that authentic audience. So, yes, I know we must be ready for students now. Oh, crap. We're not. Sorry for saying that. We want to now, that's all the things you had to think about as a teacher. These are the things now you have to do. And this seems like an awful lot, but when you get used to doing it, it really isn't. And it's so worth it. You'll want to do it for almost everything you teach. You want to lay the groundwork with scientific vocabulary, not necessarily content vocabulary, but the science and engineering practices. So you want to talk about variables. You want to talk about a hypothesis, um, the engineering design process. Familiarize students with basic skills. So I'm going to say this really quickly. I put that remind in there uh, so that to tell you about the 81 millimeter mortar and adjusting artillery fire. Uh, I went to school on a four-year ROTC scholarship. I was going to become a doctor or so, I, you know, that's what I thought. And uh, between my junior and senior year, I went to Fort Bragg, North Carolina as a cadet. ROTC cadet, and we started doing artillery work. I, I actually fired the 81 millimeter mortar. I adjusted artillery fire so that we wouldn't get fired on by live rounds, but that we would hit our target. So why am I telling you this? Because I became an artillery officer because I had the opportunity to work with these things ahead of time. So let your students work with the rain gauges. Let your students work with um, getting soil moisture, using the Calitu for aerosols, all those sorts of things, because all of a sudden your students will be like, wow, this is really cool. Not only do I feel like a scientist, but this is something that I really, really enjoy. Elevate the overall assignment to create a buzz. Real, you know, okay, you guys, in 10 days, we're going to be talking about our research project. Oh, no, it's day number nine. Tomorrow, we're going to talk about it. Really create a buzz so that your kids are all excited about that. Have a keynote speaker to officially open up research season. That speaks for itself. Establish a theme if you want to. I usually try to establish a theme just because it's easier for us to do um, community outreach. Uh, we did the water cycle one year and we, we introduced clouds, soil moisture, we did rain with the global precipitation measurement mission, the satellite mission. Finally, teach students about the three basic types of research questions. There they are. I'm not going to go through them tonight. Once again, you can Google them. Most people know what they are. If you're a science teacher or a science, uh, scientist, uh, but certainly have your students understand there are different ones. So now, are we ready for students? Yes. Yay. We're ready for students. So what do you do? Well, you start to brainstorm. And you want to make sure that when you brainstorm, it's um, organized chaos. And that it... Um, your students are able to call out things and you teach them how not to talk over each other. You start to realize who's interested in what. You take into consideration the demographics of your student population. Think about season appropriate. 
You know, sorry, that's in the winter. What could you do in the summer or vice versa? Current events, have your students do a current events project to see what's going on in the world. Talk to parents and community elders, especially if you've got a tribal community. Think out of the box. It doesn't have to be a science research project. It could be an engineering project. And through all of this, you will then either know how to group your students, or if you've already grouped your students, you will kind of get a feel for what sort of project they might be interested in. But they're the ones who are brainstorming this. They're the ones who are going, you know, you throw out, well, what about the atmosphere? Because you know you have all the tools for the atmosphere. What could we study? Um, water. And you kind of guide them along so they start to develop their own ideas, but you've actually planted those ideas in their heads. Okay. Then you have the big reveal. And that's where you say, okay, we're gonna reveal the groups today and not your research question, but we're going to reveal, based on your conversation, what your overall subject is gonna be. Maybe kind of what you wanna look for. And you set that up and they're so excited that they get together in their small groups and they start to come up with ideas. And then, and I'm not gonna go through all of these, um, you can read them. The students are going to understand that they, they could do one of these four things. And in GLOBE, this is extremely easy to do. It's very rewarding to the student and it makes a really great project. Oh, by the way, I got these from uh, Duke EDU a long time ago. Um, they have some really interesting things about science uh, research. I'm always plugging satellites, so all I'm going to say is satellites and the satellite partnership, and this goes along really well with what David said, um, are great ways to introduce your students to the GLOBE protocols and do some ground truthing, whether we call it that or not, ground validation, um, but there are some of the great um, satellites that we can use. So now we go into the stewardship project. You can make it as big or as small as you want. Here are just some basic ideas. You can um, alter it and tailor it based on your community. So you can go to local businesses. These four eighth graders went to Public Service Electric and Gas up in Newark, about two hours north of us, and pitched to the execs a program that would improve heating and cooling efficiency in the homes. State and national organizations. Here we worked with the United Soybean Board. And for those of you out there who want to do something with um, sustainable or even do something with, let's say, aerosols, that sort of thing, the United Soybean Board is a wonderful organization with which to work. Industry, through the United Soybean Board and a company in North Carolina, we actually did um, research on bio-based blacktop sealers and were able, um, the company came up, showed the kids how to do this, and then they went ahead and measured it. We measured it. This would be great for urban um, heat island effect to see if the blacktop sealers have any effect on the, the temperature in places where there's a ton of asphalt. Community outreach is another way to bring an authentic audience to what you do. We in CSEP have to do a community outreach program. Um, we at first just went to individual um, places like McGuire Air Force Base. We had a troop of Boy Scouts come in, um, come in and we talked to them to help them get their weather badge. Here we did the Medford Science Summit. For three years we had a summit at our school. The students picked topics that they thought would be applicable to our community. Um, they also made scientific posters. Uh, these are over several years that you're seeing. Here's a setup. We had not only posters, but we also had interactive stations strictly to improve the scientific literacy of the community. Everybody can do that. Now we work with our county at our county earth fair, and we probably see anywhere from three to 500 people once a year, and we educate them again on science to improve their scientific literacy. Um, we have stations set up over here, and on the right side, you see students actually giving a presentation. 
Get involved with science organizations. We have three middle school students uh, uh, that will be presenting at the American Meteorological Society meeting um, because we, we got involved with uh, satellites, the GOZAR satellite, and also I'm a member of AMS, but it's the first time that middle schoolers will be presenting at an AMS meeting. So just as a recap, the teacher drives the train, seamlessly guides the students towards the light, gives students the tools they need to be successful, includes students in the exciting brainstorming phase, reveals the groups and basic areas of interest, super important, helps teams finalize the research question, supports the research, and the teacher is helpful in uncovering opportunities for stewardship projects and presenting to an authentic audience. So that's it. I know it was fast and furious, uh, but it at least gives you things to think about and a good way that you can have students produce a research question in class and then take what they figure out to an authentic audience. Uh, please feel free to visit, uh, email me with any questions or visit our website, ccepcentral.org, to see the type of website that the students have put together and are still working on. And that's it. That was amazing, Vicki. Good. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> I never know how long I take. I'm sorry if I took a little too long. Oh, I, I think it was worthwhile. Uh, and of course, Vicki is very uh, modest. The CSEP is a program that her students started, and she wants to get other schools involved in the program so that, as they can work together and share. So if you are interested in being uh, a member of CSEP, uh, please contact her, or you can contact me or Janet, or, you know, we can get you in contact with, with Vicki to start you on the, on the way. All right, uh, any questions for Vicki? What questions do we have? Um, one question, how early in the year do you start it? How early in the year do I start the research? Yeah. It depends what I think our students are going to be using. Like, for example, with aerosols, it's hard to do over the winter, that sort of thing. This year, my CSEP students are working first on the NSTA Toshiba Explorer Vision contest. So they'll be finished with putting that together um, in December, the middle of December. And then we'll go ahead and start research. The type of research we're doing, our aerosol research will continue through the spring, but the type of research we're doing will have enough in about two to three months of data gathering um, to participate in the IVSS and also the Student Research Symposium in May. And you usually do one research question for the year? I do, I usually think of one theme but I have six teams. I have about, I usually have between 18 and 22 students in CSEP, and they're usually divided into six teams. So we will have six different research questions. And, um, but I try to keep them all tied in so that they can collaborate with one another and they can see cause and effect in some of the things they're doing with um, what other students are researching as well. That sounds great. All right. Well, thank you, Vicki. We'll, we'll move on to Angie. Um, I do want to say I'm going to be, I have my coat on because I'm going to I have to go get my son at musical practice. So next you'll see me, I'll probably be in my car in the parking lot of the school, but there's not great cell phone reception there. So it could be interesting. Anyway, so I just want to say that. So Angie's going to uh, wrap up or, you know, anyway. Uh, share her stuff. <laughs> so, all right, thanks, Angie. Thank you. So that's a tough act to follow, Vicki. Mm. Um, can you guys see my screen? Yes. All right. So um, they wanted me to talk this evening about actually accessing some NASA data. And there are a few things like the satellite matches, which are available quickly, but um, due to the nature of scientific data and the fact that 
you know, sometimes there are equipment issues or different things, you know, there are some data integrity checks and that sort of thing that go on before it's released. And so it can be hard sometimes on these projects for students to get, like, go out and make measurements and then see what the NASA measurements were the very next day or something, right? So what I decided to focus on this evening was more of a focus on historical data, because when the kids are doing that research on their projects, and they're just trying to get context and background information and find out sort of what the norms are, that can all be very useful and helpful. And we know that there are globe data available, um, but sometimes the globe data are very incomplete because there may not be a school in say a latitude that you wanna to compare to or something of that nature. So um, there is an additional resource that I'm gonna focus on tonight, which is called my NASA data. So just so that you know, from a contextual point of view, um, I am at NASA Langley. I've been there for just a little over a year now but I was in the classroom and for 12 years I was teaching middle school um, science and math and I did all the science in the whole middle school because it was a small private school so I did I did sixth seventh and eighth grade science for 12 years so I utilized globe and I did use uh, my NASA data with my students as well so um, one of the things that was really good about that was I was able to sort of um, have this globe thread through all their years. So if anybody has um, an, ex an opportunity like that, I just wanted to point that out. So um, this is the landing page of my NASA data, which is organized by Earth Sphere, as well as by um, NGSS standard and phenomena. Now we roll out phenomena once or twice a year so it's not all inclusive yet but it is there. Um, and so one of the components of my NASA data is that we have this Earth System Data Explorer. Okay and this is kind of what the interface looks like and I'm going to go in more detail but it is very easy to pull the data that is in there. It's got some analysis tools. You can get maps, you can get graphs, or you can download data. You can search by time or by geographic area. You can compare in some cases up to four variables at a time. I'll explain that in a minute. You can make animations. It's well organized. It is historical data. Um, if you want to download the data, you'll want to do one data set at a time, but you can download it for additional analysis. So what you're going to do is you go to the My NASA Data page and you click here on Visualize Data. Can everybody see this well enough? Okay. So when I click on visualize data here, I get that interface screen I was talking about. Depending on your browser, you may get this box here. If you do, just say okay. So you will want to go up to the upper left corner and click on data set and you see the data are organized by Earth sphere. Okay, now in globe, we have the lithosphere, which we call the geosphere in my NASA data. And also GLOBE doesn't really have the cryosphere, although they do have some things like frost tube and that kind of thing. Um, but if you click on the sphere, and since we're talking about the urban heat island, I'm gonna click on the geosphere. Now you have an option of all data. And so there are different data types and, and we can go in and find them. Or you can go by featured phenomena, which I'm gonna, pull up urban heat island and select the daytime skin temperature. Okay, so the first thing that will come up will be a map. 
In addition, there's this legend here at the top that tells you what it is. It tells you where the data come from, describes the unit, which is very useful for the students oftentimes, especially we have some data sets that are unitless and um, we go into that as well. But you can close this little legend to be able to see more on the screen, okay? So it'll default and it'll default to the earliest year and month that those data are available, okay? If I click here on 2019, you see these data only go through July of 2019. So your students are not gonna go outside. They're not gonna be able to pull the October measurements from, from my NASA data um, that came you know, from the same month they were making observations. But what they can do is pull 2018 October and so I change the date, I need to go over here and click on update plot. In addition, if I check this little box here next to update plot, it'll automatically update as I change parameters. Okay, so they could look at, well, what was it like last year in October? Um, some of these data are monthly averages, which these are because they're only giving us a month, some are not. So that's another thing too they can look at. How did our daily measurements compare to a monthly average? Do, do our daily measurements average out to that monthly average? You know, these are some kinds of things they can do and ways that they can incorporate this. Also, if you don't wanna look at the whole world, you can click on this box here. At, well, let's start. You can click on the box and you can select an area and it zooms in for you, okay? Um, you can select some predefined areas as well, but sometimes students are like North America, but sometimes students are interested in a smaller area than that. Okay, so. Uh, let me reset it. Sorry. Okay, so here we go. We have an area. Um, now, in addition, so I changed my date. Over here where it says one plot on the left-hand side, I can compare two or four. So I'm gonna choose to select compare two. And so now I have two here. So I could look at 2018 January and compare that to 2018 October and we see some differences. Right, I'll go back to October. I can also, uh, you saw that it, under the phenomenon, there were two data sets, okay? So if they're within that same phenomenon, I can compare the two data, the data sets. That's why I said it could be up to four. So now I'm looking at the daytime compared to the nighttime for the same month. Okay, and your students can do that. So that's really helpful. Um, you, can, you can do up to four panes. If, you know, you could do like one per season. It just, you know, there's lots of different ways. Now I'm gonna go back to one because for um, downloading data, it is easier if we're looking at just one. So I'm gonna show you how to download a picture now, which would be to click on print. It comes up and then you just right click, you say print and you print it to a PDF. Okay, that is how we use that on our, come on, I have all these little zoom windows in my way here. Um, the other thing I can do is I can do a line plot, okay? And I would print these the same way. When you click on the time plot, it, it's going to down, it'll default, like it just picked a location in that circle. So you can see the lat long here. It's not that far from, from Toledo, it's, Toledo I had was 41.6 north and 83.6 west. So it's, this is in that circle. 
I can change the time frame, let's say from to do five years, they can certainly see a pattern there. And you can print these the same way, but you can also download the data, which I click on save as, this screen comes up. I, will, I always select CSV. If you can accommodate net CDF, that would be great. You can specify your time parameters here. And it, it comes up like this and you have to right click on it and then save it again on your computer. So, um, the last thing I wanted to show you, if I go back into the map, is this option up here to animate. So if I click on animate, I never change anything here. I just say, okay, and let's look at five years worth and submit it. And it'll start off and it'll go kind of slowly, but then once it goes, goes through the whole process there, I'm gonna zoom out a little so you can see the other, it'll start playing for them. And you can advance it one at a time, you can change the speed, but they can see the changes over time. So that's a nice tool for the students as well. Um, so if you're interested in other data sets, in addition to surface temperature, remember here data set, we have quite a few data sets out there for the different spheres, different phenomena, and um, just general data that's out there. Does anybody have any questions? Do you have to um, sign into the site or is it open without signing in? You do not have to sign in. Now that being said, there's also not really a way to save your work. So if you know they have a graph or something they really like and they, they want those data, they, they need to save those images or download the data. And once you download the data, it's a comma delimited file, they'll need to upload it into Excel or um, Sheets or some tool that can use that and um, work with those data. Sometimes with especially my sixth graders, I would get data for them and um, just get it into a spreadsheet for them and then let them work with it. it. Just depended on what their skills were with the software. So in the how do you get surface temperature again? Yeah, I mean, should I, I to sure how to do it again? I went into data set and then under geosphere. So let me turn it off and go back through it. Um, you want me to zoom? Let me make it a little bit bigger. Here, uh, geosphere. And then I went under the featured phenomenon of urban heat island and I clicked on daytime skin temperature. But again, you could do day or night. So we have other data sets like in atmosphere. We have things like um, long and shortwave radiation at the surface. So these data can be kind of interesting. We have net atmospheric radiation with and without clouds, which can be interesting. But again, these are, all, these are monthly. Mm -hmm. And so um, that, that's an interesting aspect. And, but it's also not a bad thing to talk to the students about the temporal scale of the data they're looking at, right? And GLOBE has some nice lessons about how weather adds up to climate, you know? Um, so you can, and, and how it's this accumulation of large amounts of data that give us these 30 year averages, right? So 
um, it's, I think it's fine for them to see that there's a place for this, right? And what place do their individual measurements potentially have in a big picture? So I think I cut out for a second, but um, Marcy was asking, are there ice cover on the Great Lakes <laughs> data? Uh, in this picture here? No, 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 in general. I don't, do we have, are you asking if we have ice cover data? I think, or yeah, I think that's what she's asking. Or is she asking like right now, <laughs> because it's, we're in a cold spell, are we having, <laughs> I mean. <laughs> well, um, I, I think Marcy, I can help you. I don't know if you know where, um, there is historical data. I should be able to tell you too. I mean, so I'll try to remember that time. The yeah. cryosphere data that we have are monthly snow and ice percent coverage, this glacier area, and sea ice extent. So, I mean, we can see what's on the monthly snow and ice cover. Let's see. Great Lakes. Uh, why are you? So white is definitely lots of possibly. Here we go. Um, we're looking at March, so you have a time for me to check? Uh, try January 2014. January 2014. Not seeing a lot there. Okay. Although it's right. percent coverage, right? So it's these light, I mean, these light blues are some, but this, it's hard to tell from this scale if there could be a little bit, right? Okay. Okay. Which again, right. could be one so of those perspective questions, right? on the ground perspective versus satellite perspective? Uh, my guess would be that the lake ice cover is not in the database. It a, may not be. This, that's my guess. And this is also a monthly percent coverage. So there'd have to be a mm -hmm. significant amount there for for a month, you know, enough to make a monthly average, right? I'm gonna stop my share now. Okay, so we keep dropping out, but it's time to wrap up. Um, Angie, thanks for your, all your help. And I want to thank all the speakers, David, Vicki, and Angie for the great presentation tonight. Uh, we will record this. It is recorded, and then we'll post it on YouTube. All right, well, so I guess I'll say thanks a lot, everybody, and have a good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thanks, everyone. Uh, really enjoyed it.